Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to tune in to this webinar. Really excited to be here today to talk to you about our newly launched Traffic Link Safety Analytics product. A little bit about me, just to build some familiarity. My name is Sal. I'm on the product marketing team here at MyaVision, and I oversee the analytic solutions at MyaVision. So that includes our ATS PMs, as well as our newly launched safety analytics product. In my role as a product marketing manager, I oversee or I act as a linchpin between the go-to-market side of the business, as well as the product and engineering teams, ensuring that good market knowledge is funneled into our product development so that you, our customers, and the market find value in them. With that, let's get right into the agenda. Three main things that we're hoping to cover in this webinar, first and foremost, is talking about the importance of safety data. This is a nice way of saying, you know, we built this product, so what, who cares, why is it valuable and what problem in the industry are we hoping to solve with it? From there, we'll go into a high level solution overview and actually talk to Traffic Link Safety Analytics and the value that it provides. And I'll actually pull up Traffic Link and give you a live demo of the metrics in action. And last but not least, we'll wrap things up with a few use cases. You know, the information that we're presenting, the data that we're generating uh, with safety analytics is fairly new, it's fairly novel. And I thought I'd pull together some hypothetical um, scenarios in which you could see the data in action and get a sense of how the workflow could tie into your um, traffic engineering or road safety analysis. I mean, we're all in the industry here, so I don't want to belabor this point too much, but the reality is traffic fatalities are a problem. You know, looking at the uh, World Health Organization's road safety report, they published these statistics and they found that every single year, 1.35 million people die on the world's roads. An additional 20 to 50 million individuals are injured every single year. And amongst those, 54% of traffic deaths are among our vulnerable road users. Now, these statistics are international data points. If we want to zoom into the United States, this translates to about 40 to 45,000 traffic fatalities every single year. Now, to put that number into context, that's the equivalent of a Boeing 737 going down every other day. That type of statistic is completely unacceptable in any industry, and it's definitely not acceptable in ours. The sad reality is that this problem is only going to get worse. What you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen here is a bar graph from the United Nations, and it's showcasing urbanization over periods of time. And what they're showing is that every single week, 3 million people are flocking into our cities, and they're projecting that by the year 2030, about two-thirds of the world's population will live in a city. Now, this poses a really unique problem for the agencies, municipalities, and individuals like ourselves in the traffic industry, because what this is telling us is more and more people are coming into our cities, which means there's going to be additional demand placed on our infrastructure. And so there's going to be this onus to try and find new ways to enable people to move around. We know that vehicles are a very inefficient mode of transportation. And so there's going to be this push towards a complete street strategy, enabling more citizen or um, pedestrian friendly modes of transportation, cyclist friendly transportation, and transit friendly modes of transportation. The inherent challenge with this solution, though, is that you're actually introducing more vulnerable road users onto our streets. And we can see from the data that these are the individuals who are most susceptible to getting injured or killed because of a traffic crash. There is some consolation. If we look at the US Department of Transportation's uh, traffic fatalities report, we see that in 2018, there was a slight reversal in the total number of fatalities taking place. It's a, a testament to some of the countermeasures that are, being, that are being put in place. But if we drill into the data a little bit more, we can see that there are some concerning trends, one of which aligns with our red light runners. The AAA Foundation has done a study and they found that red light running in the United States is at a 10 year all time high. You know, this one tends to get me the most and I'm sure many of you can, can agree with it. Back when I was in driving school, you know, you learn green means go, red means stop. It's, it's fundamentally a non-negotiable. Yet more than two people die on US roads every single day because of a red light runner. The statistic that tends to scare me the most is that the AAA Foundation in, their, in the same study 
they actually found that 93% of individuals will say, you know, it's unacceptable, we agree, we shouldn't be running red lights. But 43% of them will have admitting, will have admit to running a red light in the past 30 days. So let's think about that. Majority of us, 90% of us agree it's not an acceptable be, uh, type of behavior, but more than 40% will have agreed to have running a red light in the past 30 days. Our impatience is literally leading to, tr leading to traffic crashes and fatalities. The second concerning trend that we're starting to see is this uptick in pedestrian fatalities and fatalities amongst our vulnerable road users. So you saw the statistic from the World Health Organization where 54% of traffic fatalities involve a vulnerable road user. In the United States, pedestrian fatalities make up about 16% of all fatalities in general. In fact, they've hit the highest that they've ever been since 1990. I believe it was in 2018, about 6,200 pedestrians were uh, killed as a result of traffic crashes, which represents a 41% increase since 2008. So we're seeing this uptrend in certain types of non-compliant behaviors or fatalities happening amongst certain types of populations. We know that this is a big problem. Our agencies know that this is a problem and the reality is it's also hitting our media outlets. So this is a snippet from the Toronto Star, which reads, you hesitate, you lose lives. Toronto votes for more aggressive vision zero road safety. Officials highway traffic fatalities in Kentucky increased in 2019. Not getting better, many have embraced vision zero in Canada, so why aren't we achieving more? Austin, Texas traffic fatalities nearly triple in January and Vision Zero New York City Council passes on dangerous driver's laws. The data supports that this is a problem, but we're also starting to see the media outlets and the news increasingly talk about this, becoming a more and more regular piece of uh, content that we're seeing in our lives. And the quantitative data also supports this. You know, interest in safety is increasing year over year. If we think back to some of those media snippets that I posted in the previous slide, a lot of them made mention to Vision Zero. Now, many of us probably know being in the industry what Vision Zero is. For those of us that are, are fairly new, Vision Zero refers to an industry-wide initiative that's focused on completely eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Vision Zero isn't necessarily the solution to the problem, but what it does represent is an adherence and a commitment to a strategy aimed at completely eliminating those fatalities. And so what becomes really clear is that road safety and Vision Zero are inextricably linked. Holy smokes, I'm having a hard time getting my words out. And so what you're seeing on the screen here is a snapshot from Google Trends data. This is publicly available. You can look at Google Trends for uh, any topic. And what we've got is a snapshot of the level of interest in Vision Zero as a search term over time. This is data specific to North America. And what you can see here is that since 2004, there's this clear trend up and to the right on the level of interest in Vision Zero. More and more people are talking about it. More and more people are interested in about it, interested in about it, and it's becoming a hotly contested thing that our agencies and municipalities are dealing with. So we all know that this is a problem, right? Traffic fatalities on the rise, and we're slowly starting to see this reversal. What are some of the things that we can do about it? Well, we can look at some countermeasures that we can institute to improve road safety. We look at our countermeasures, typically they fall into one of three categories. We have education-focused countermeasures, enforcement-focused countermeasures, as well as engineering-driven countermeasures. Education countermeasures are, I wanna say they're more passive in nature. They're trying to influence road user behavior, but they're leveraging things like marketing campaigns, advertising, as well as promotional awareness. And the hypothesis is if you can raise everyone's level of education and awareness, your level of compliance on our streets is likely to increase, which should in turn have an impact on safety. And a great example of this is the Take Another Look campaign that the city of Toronto um, launched back in December, where they're trying to raise everyone's level of awareness on pedestrian fatalities. Enforcement countermeasures are in a similar thread as education countermeasures, where they're trying to influence road user behavior but they're more of a slap on the wrist, and this can manifest in the shape of a speeding ticket or a red light runner camera. I mean, while we've got Toronto on the screen here, I was reading some news 
uh, the other day. And the stats are coming out that red light, or not red light running, speeding cases in Toronto are up about 30% in the past month, and cases of stunt driving are up about 200% in Toronto. So the Ontario Provincial Police, they're hard at work, credit to them, thank you for, for doing what you do, but you know, I think people are assuming because there's less volume on the roadways, it's giving them a license to have a lead foot, and clearly that's not acceptable. So another example of an enforcement countermeasure in action. And last but not least, you've got engineering-driven countermeasures. And this is looking at from a design perspective, whether it's infrastructural or signal optimization, what can we do to improve the safety of our roads? This can be anything from improving the visibility of the traffic signal so that drivers know that there's a red light coming up. It can be something as um, grand as completely redesigning the inter uh, intersection to be a roundabout so that there isn't a need to stop. And on the signal optimization front, we can look at things like uh, increasing our all red clearance interval, we can institute leading pedestrian intervals, or even things like dilemma zone detection. The best of strategies are ones that encompass all three of these E's, and you're seeing an example of that on the right-hand side of the screen here. This is a snippet from Toronto's Vision Zero, Vision Zero strategy, and you can see some of the initiatives that they have in place but they're attacking the problem on all fronts. And ideally that's what you wanna do. You wanna tap into every channel when it comes to improving road safety. Now the logical question that follows from all of this is, first and foremost, how do I know where I need to deploy my countermeasures? How do I know which countermeasures I should actually deploy? And how do I know whether or not those countermeasures are actually being effective? Are they having the desired impact that we thought that they would? And this is where myovision can lend itself really nicely to the industry because first and foremost, we are a traffic data company aimed at improving both the safety and efficiency of the agencies that we work with. A fundamental tenant of Vision Zero, of the Vision Zero strategy, is being able to collect and analyze data to make the most informed and appropriate decisions when instituting our countermeasures. So the punchline here is that good decisions require good data. We were talking about countermeasures and data. So where does the data for countermeasures and safety analysis come from in the industry today? And really there's four major channels that we can tap into. The first of which is crash data. And now crash data is definitely an important component in the analysis of road safety, readily available. And it's definitely something that we should ingest into our analysis. But as I'm sure many of you will agree to, the inherent problem with crash data is that it's reactive in nature, right? You're reliant on a collision to take place, injuries to happen, and potentially fatalities to occur to have a data point which you can then use to go about informing your decisions moving forward. I was actually in um, Atlanta, Georgia a couple of months ago talking to a safety engineer about this, and among other things, the other challenge that he cited about crash data is the fact that it takes so long to aggregate. I mean, if you want a statistically um, relevant sample set of data, you're gonna need to wait a significant amount of time before you have any good insight into the data. And that was one of the challenges that he was citing alongside the fact that crash data is only as good as the individuals filling it out. He had some more things to say on that, but uh, I'm gonna keep that between us. He was, he was definitely not speaking too highly about the people filling in crash data reports. From there, we can also go into manual observation. So in the same conversation with this, um, with this engineer, he was telling me that oftentimes agencies will solicit their help in conducting what's called a safety audit. And that would involve him and his team manually being stationed at the intersection to observe the flow of traffic. Definitely an important way of collecting data. They would sometimes also do things like geometric measurements, as well as do an analysis of crash data. And he was telling me that it often takes a long time to conduct a safety audit, simply because at times you need to collect around 100 hours of observation. That's on the extreme end. I did have a follow-up comment to this, which I'll, which I'll share with all of you, which was, you know, if you're being stationed at the intersection to manually observe what's going on, aren't you a vulnerable road user and aren't they the ones who are most likely at risk based off of the data? And it was, it was a funny interaction. He kind of just shrugged his shoulders and said, yep, Welcome to the life of an engineer. From there, we've got public complaints and media. So this is another very powerful method of collecting data in terms of road safety. 
the challenge with this, similar to crash data, is that it is a lag indicator. It is happening as a result of you know, some type of collision or some type of inherent safety problem, and that's why the media and public complaints are coming through. I have noticed, however, in the realm of public safety and road safety, public complaints and media exert a significant amount more pressure than they do in the world of traffic signal retiming. So a lot of you are traffic engineers. I'm sure you, you can attest to this. Cape, one of the main KPIs when it comes to understanding whether or not your signals are operating the way they should be is public complaints. And oftentimes they get thrown into the backlog. The gravity that public complaints carry in the world of road safety is so much stronger. And of course, it's because the loss of life is at stake. And the last angle that we can collect data from is from surrogate measures. And this is where things get particularly exciting. So what you're seeing on the right side of the screen here is a depiction of the safety pyramid. So many of you are probably familiar with the safety pyramid. Some of you might very well have studied the safety pyramid and know it like the back of your hand. But this is essentially showing us events happening on our roadways. The wider the block, the more likely that event is to take place. And as you go up this pyramid, these events are increasing in severity. So at the very bottom, we have undisturbed passages. These are, you know, traffic is operating as it should be. Things are smooth and efficient. No concerns, no worries, we're good to go. At the very top, you've got your crashes, and this is where your killed or seriously injured um, data points come from. And sadly, this is where most agencies rely uh, when it comes to collecting their data. This middle section is really interesting because this is where your near misses take place, your close calls. And so though these are areas where collisions have not taken place, they are areas of high risk. They in, in effect serve as leading indicators into those crash events that are taking place. And the hypothesis follows that if you can proactively identify these near misses in your network, you can get ahead of the crash institute a countermeasure and have it a tangible impact on citizen safety. And that's what traffic link safety analytics is all about. It's this data-driven approach towards vision zero. It's giving traffic teams the tools they need to understand both from a vehicle as well as pedestrian perspective where non-compliant behavior is taking place. It's proactive in nature because it's 24-7 365 data collection at the intersection, you're able to use this data to go about prioritizing your workflow so that you can institute your countermeasures at the locations where you can have the highest amount of impact for citizen safety. You can use the data to conduct before and after analyses. So we've put in place a countermeasure. Is it actually having the desired outcome that we intended it on having? And how are we trending towards our goals? And last but not least, video context. Time and time again in research papers, in discussions, the importance of observation, having an eye into the intersection is so crucial to the analysis of road safety because it's giving you the characteristics of the intersection from both a situational as well as behavioral perspective. Traffic link safety analytics is made possible through our full stack hardware that's installed permanently at the intersection. You're going to need the MyVision Smart Link, which is our wireless communications device, the data aggregator, as well as the travel time probe. The MyVision Smart Sense, which is our edge computing device running our computer vision algorithms used to support our detection as well as our continuous counts, as well as the MyVision Smart View 360. This is the 4K fisheye camera that's mounted at the intersection that's working in tandem with the MyVision Smart Sense to provide detection as well as continuous counts. Now, the reason Traffic Link Safety Analytics requires our full stack hardware is because it's piggybacking off the unique functionality of each of our hardware components. So in effect, they're all working together to render some really interesting data. Where are the charts? They're in Traffic Link. That's my quirky way of saying it's time to jump into the Traffic Link portal. So sit tight, let me get that set up. Brent, can you give me the thumbs up that you can still see my screen? I just want to make sure that the uh, technology is still working. Yep, we got it nice and clear Excellent. here. Thanks, Sal. Awesome. So welcome to the Traffic Link portal. Some of you might be familiar with this, but Traffic Link Safety Analytics lives within the Insights tab in Traffic Link. This is also where 
our ATS PMs or our signal performance measures live, as well as our turning movement count data. Traffic link safety analytics uh, since the launch has come with two new metrics, the pedestrian compliance chart, as well as the red light runner chart. So when they're made available for you in your traffic link instance, they'll automatically populate in this section. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and click into them and I'm gonna render them and we'll speak to them each individually once they're both populated. But like our, our ETS PMs, once you click on a chart, it's gonna ask you which intersection you want to populate. So I'm gonna go to, let's look at, um, Portland, Caroline, let's look at this one. And for pedestrian compliance, you're gonna to need to select the side phase that you want. And just so we have some more data, I'm gonna go back in time. This is courtesy of Amazon Web Services. We're able to store historical data. We're gonna go back to March and let's look at March 5th, why don't we? It's gonna render. And at the same time, I'm also going to populate our red light runner chart just so we have them side by side. I'm gonna do the same thing. We're going to go to a different intersection. Let's go to the northbound through movement, and we're on the same date. Excellent. <laughs> of course, because of uh, social distancing, I wanted to select times that were in the past just because we'd have more data points to look at. So beautiful. There they are in all their glory. So let's look at the red light runner chart first. Um, right off the bat, what you'll notice is we have three axes on the what are on the x-axis we've got the time of day on the left hand y-axis we've got the time since yellow start in the number of seconds and on the right hand y-axis we've got the red light runners per hour both of these data points the red light runner and the pedestrian compliance are leveraging the uh, smart links ability to pull high resolution signal phasing information and we're combining that with the Smart Sense and Smart View 360's ability to capture turning movement count data. And so as soon as, for the case of red light runners, as soon as a vehicle hits the mid block of the intersection, we're going to classify it and align that with the corresponding signal phase. And you can see on the chart, we have two blocks. The yellow section represents that when the signal phase was amber and the red represents when the signal was red. Like all of our charts, these are interactive. I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. So you can see all these individual data points are instances or vehicles going through the intersection. This dotted line over here represents the hourly red light runner count. Now we wanted to be really clear about highlighting the difference between our systemic and blatant red light runners. Some of these individuals in the four to six range may very well be passing through the clearance interval. And so we've introduced a second data point titled detector hits over 10 seconds. These represent individuals who are blatantly going through the signal. They had no regard for what the signal was telling them. And you can see two examples of them over here. And the great thing about all of these data points is when you hover over them, it's actually giving you a timestamp. So we can see this one was 15.7 seconds past the yellow star. Absolutely terrifying statistic looking at it right off right, right now. But the power in this is you can go back and use video recall to visually inspect the intersection also. Jumping over to the pedestrian compliance chart, the first thing to note is visually you can see that it's very similar to the red light runner chart in terms of design. That was an intentional decision that we made because when you think about the data that this is generating, it is similar to the red light runner data, except it's for pedestrians. One was compliance data for our vehicles, this is compliance data for our pedestrians. Similar to the red light runner chart, the way this data is populated is we're using high resolution signal phasing information using the smart link, as well as the turning movement count data from the smart sense and smart view 360. As soon as a pedestrian hits the middle of the crosswalk, we are going to classify it and align that with the corresponding signal phase. Similar to the red light runner, we have a yellow section which represents the flashing don't walk uh, phase of the pedestrian crosswalk and the red represents the don't walk. Along the x-axis, we have time of day. The left-hand y-axis is time since the flash start in seconds. And on the right-hand y-axis, we have the number of crossings of don't walk per hour. So again, similar, to, similar design to a red light runner chart. What I will call out is right off the bat, you can see that generally speaking, our pedestrians are more non-compliant than our vehicles. 
This is a consistent trend that we've seen across all of our deployments. And I'm sure many of you can, can you know, nod your head to this. I'm sure, you know, maybe you don't want to admit to it. It might be taboo since we're all in the industry, but I'll be the first to uh, admit it. Pedestrians are much more impatient than our vehicles. And if we look both ways, we see no vehicles, we're more likely to cut across the intersection. So we're, we're in the tail end of the presentation here, everyone. Um, and as mentioned in the agenda, the last thing that we wanted to cover were some use cases. This is fairly novel data. And so to get the creative juices flowing, I've created some use cases that we can talk through uh, just to highlight how these metrics can be used to support your existing uh, challenges and workflow. So here we've got a pedestrian compliance chart. Uh, just to give you some characteristics about this intersection, it's a high volume intersection, lots of vehicle traffic, lots of uh, pedestrians, lots of cyclists. And interestingly, there's also a transportation line, a light rail transportation line going through this particular intersection. So if we pull up the pedestrian compliance chart, what we can see right off the bat is similar to the previous one that I showed you in traffic link, our pedestrians are non-compliant, right? There, there's a behavioral thing going on. We know this. But given the sheer volume and activity taking place at this intersection, perhaps it's cause for concern. Maybe we should investigate it a little bit further. And so what we can do is we can tap into some of the other insights that we offer through Traffic Link. And one example of that could be looking at our pedestrian delay. Let's look at how long they're being forced to wait. If we pull up the pedestrian delay chart, you can see that in some cases, our pedestrians are being forced to wait anywhere from 250 all the way up to a thousand seconds. Now, if my math is correct, that translates to anywhere from four to 15 minutes of delay. Absolutely staggering and unacceptable amount of time to have to wait to get your, your crosswalk signal. Now, what we can do is I'm actually gonna superimpose the pedestrian compliance chart over top of this. And what becomes pretty apparent is that there's this clear cut trend. The more delay the pedestrian experiences, the higher the non-compliance. And this is another interesting finding that we're seeing across all of our data sets. The longer a pedestrian is forced to wait, they're gonna be more non-compliant. And again, I'm sure many of us can attest to this, although again, might be taboo, we may not wanna admit it, just being in the industry. So now that I have some type of a correlation, what's the next level of diagnosis? Well, diagnosis, well, if I'm a traffic engineer or a safety engineer, I'm thinking, okay, is there a problem with my pedestrian push buttons? Maybe I should look into those. Let's say for the, uh, the, this example, we've looked into it, pedestrian push buttons look perfectly fine. So what's going on here? Why is, why is there so much non-compliance and why is there so much pedestrian delay? Well, remember, part of safety analytics is having the luxury of tapping into video recall and having that eye into the intersection. And the video reveals all. What we can see here is pedestrians are being non-compliant primarily when the transit line is coming through. And so they're actually cutting across the intersection to make it to their transit um, line so that they can get to their end destination a little bit quicker. And this is an interesting trend that uh, our development lead has been steadily monitoring where in some cases, you can actually infer the transit line based off of the level of compliance you're seeing with our pedestrians. Now, while that does explain the non-compliant behavior, it doesn't explain why they're experiencing such a high amount of delay. And so with further analysis, what becomes apparent is the, whenever that transit line was coming through, it was erasing all of the calls placed on the controller. And so unbeknownst to these pedestrians, they may very well have been compliant, pushing the button, waiting for their uh, signal, but when the transit line came through, it was erasing all of the calls. And so they didn't know that they had to push the button again. And so understanding this whole scenario, what we can now do is institute the most appropriate and specific countermeasures. We don't need to rely on a blanket solution. And in this hypothetical situation, those countermeasures could include everything from holding the transit line. This might require some collaboration between the traffic engineering team, as well as the transit team, just having a conversation and saying, hey, we're noticing that there's a potential safety issue here. Can we work something out? Another avenue could be just putting some signage on the pedestrian push buttons and saying, hey, you might need to push this button again. I'm sure from a data perspective and impacting the controller, that might not be the best solution. But again, we're just being creative, thinking out of the box here. And last but not least, we can look to shorter cycle lengths. 
let's look at another example. And in this case, let's look at our red light runners. So similar to the previous example, let's give some characteristics about this intersection. Um, all we know about it is that it's an intersection that's experiencing a high amount of systemic red light runners. Uh, and it's also part of a coordinated, uh, a coordinated corridor. Okay, those are the two things that we know. Okay, well, we know that we see a lot of systemic red light runners, and this is obviously a problem for, for two reasons. One, if you're a driver, it's a very difficult position to be in because you're now being forced to potentially go through a red light, which we know is inherently unsafe behavior. And if you're a driver, you might very well be on the receiving end of an enforcement countermeasure in the shape of a ticket. So we don't want that. But on the flip side, we may also be making the driver engage in harsh braking. And so again, because we have the luxury of video, we can peep into the intersection and we can actually corroborate the fact that yes, harsh braking is taking place. This is a high risk uh, form of behavior because of course it increases the susceptibility of a fender bender taking place. So we know that there's a high amount of systemic red light runners. We see that harsh braking is taking place but we also need to check into the coordination. So we knew that it was a coordinated intersection. Let's pull up, say, a time-space diagram and see whether or not our coordination is in check. If we pull up a time-space diagram, this is another metric available through traffic link, we can see that the coordination has completely been thrown off. That's indicative by these really thin purple bands. Ideally, we want to see thick purple bands going all the way through the time-space diagram. So now we're thinking, okay, we have a good sense of where this problem is taking place we have a good understanding of potentially why this problem is taking place let's institute a fix let's deploy our countermeasures in a situation like this it can be something as simple as fixing the coordination issue perhaps there's a clock drift thing maybe we just need to change up our timing plans whatever the case may be we can institute that countermeasure and then lean on the red light runner chart once again to conduct our before and after analyses to see if it actually made the desired impact that we thought it would Another potential countermeasure that we can deploy is looking to increase the yellow and all red phases. Now, this is the really interesting one. I know it's at times been a fairly content or contentious topic in the industry. I throw this in here because there's a really interesting story associated with it. Some of you might very well have been following, I'll, I'll call it this saga in traffic engineering, but there was an individual, his name was Matt Yarstrom, and he was victim to what he felt was a systemic red light running problem. You know, he, he had to go through a red light because signal timings were off and he was on the receiving end of an enforcement countermeasure. He got a ticket and he was vehemently refuting the fact that it wasn't his fault. He said, you know what, this is not my problem. It's a systemic red light running problem. And because he was in the industry, he actually put his brain to use and he did the calculations, he did the analysis, and it turns out that that agency had a systemic red light running problem and they had to address their timing plans. And it's great because recently ITE has published new guidelines on the all red clearance interval and Brent can share the link to that article in the chat window. But he's the publisher, Matt Yarstrom is actually the publisher on these new IT guidelines. So I think it's a great story um, and definitely an interesting one that's probably going to go down in the history of traffic engineering lore. So when we think about another countermeasure that we can deploy, we can definitely look to re-timing or looking at changing the timing for our, our yellow and our all red clearance intervals. Just a few quick key takeaways for all of you. First and foremost, Safety Analytics, it's our new product, and it's really providing 24-7, 365, uh, data into our red light runners and pedestrian compliance data. The other thing that's really important to take away is video is so integral and having that eye into the intersection is so integral when it comes to safety analysis because it can help you infer and solve some complex problems. And last but not least, in the case of traffic link safety analytics, our full stack hardware is required uh, to be permanently installed at the intersection. Again, because the gener data that we're generating is relying on the unique functionality of all of our hardware components. If you'd like some more information, feel free to visit myvision.com slash traffic link safety analytics for more information uh, or reach out to one of your sales reps. Always happy to engage. With that, I'm gonna take a quick pause, look at some questions because we do have some time to field some Q&A. Okay, so one of the questions that I've got here 
is on the red light runner chart leveraging turning movement count data versus yeah okay so i sh yeah so this is comparing turning movement count data versus detection uh, it's a great question um they're curious to know why we decided to go with turning movement counts rather than using post stop bar detection for our red light runners the the reason behind that is is really twofold the first of which is from a configuration perspective using the turning movement count data is actually easier from a configuration perspective you know if you have that data set up it's simply a matter of flipping the switch getting the software activated and there's no additional configuration to be done when it comes to drawing new detection zones so really it makes your life easier using the turning movement count data the second piece is it's actually from an accuracy perspective we found a little more accurate we think about the use cases of using post stop bar detection for red light runners in many states, many agencies, making a red light or making a right turn on a red light is a permissible movement. If we were to use post stop bar detection, that would actually classify it as a red light runner. We know red light runners, even having one additional one, can skew the data significantly. Because we're using our turning movement counts, we're only looking at through movements. And so from an accuracy perspective, uh, we're much more accurate. So there's a question on cost. Can municipalities share the cost under equipment? Um, I'd encourage you to get in touch with your sales reps. So because this is our full stack hardware um, and we have, and sorry, because this is a software module on our full stack hardware, um, your sales reps would probably be the best ones to engage with. Uh, on something like that. When you, you talk about can municipalities share the cost and or the equipment, we we have seen some instances where um, bordering municipalities actually share a traffic link instance um, because they want to ensure that there's you know smooth coordination or they want to coordinate their projects on corridors that pass their jurisdiction. So we have seen instances of, instances of that, and I don't think it would be too much of a problem. Again, it's something that you would need to connect with your sales rep to get their input and, and work with our customer experience team to get that all set up. Another question that came up is, what would be considered a vulnerable road user? So I think the simple definition to this would be anyone that's not a vehicle. Um, so a cyclist, a rollerblader, someone on an e-scooter, a pedestrian, uh, those would all be individuals who would, we would consider a vulnerable road user. Another question that came up, um, is this available on a study basis? That's a great question. Um, and I know that in the industry, oftentimes safety studies are done on a per study basis. They're not done on a permanent ongoing basis. Um, that's a great question. What we can do is with our scout line of business, you can definitely use that to collect video data. The metrics that I presented are primarily for our traffic link solution. So if you're looking for pedestrian compliance data, if you're looking for things like red light runner data, we don't have an automated way to provide that through MyVision Scout, but our product team is always excited and eager to engage with customers for use cases. We also have a very rich ecosystem of partners where we are investigating other safety applications. So if that is something of interest to you, the long answer is today we don't offer those metrics, but there's an asterisk to that because I don't want to say it's outside the realm of possibility. So it's definitely something worth investigating. Wow, there are so many amazing questions here. I'm loving this. Um, we have another question saying, how far back in time can you go to verify the analytics data with video? So on the smart link, we have a hard drive which stores video data for up to seven days. And it operates like a, I think it's a Raspberry Pi or a turntable where once it hits the seven day mark, the first day of data will be erased and it'll be pre-populated with the eighth day of data. So it's on this turnstile style of hardware or hard drive, we can store data for up to seven days with respects to video. Now that being said, you can actually go into the traffic link platform and download video and then you've got it in perpetuity for however long you want because it'll actually save to your desktop desktop computer so as long as you catch it within that seven day window you can have it in perpetuity for as long as you'd like 
is one smart view 360 enough to see a whole intersection so it's another great question generally speaking we've seen in most of our deployments one smart view 360 is uh, sufficient to capture everything that's going on at the intersection it's one of the advantages of having a single fisheye camera at the intersection um, is it's capturing everything there are some instances for for very large intersections where you might need to deploy two uh, two smart view 360s to capture everything with the highest level of accuracy. And we have some deployments where we've had to use um, two smart view 360s. This would definitely be vetted out in the sales process. We have a technical fit section where the customer experience team gets involved. They analyze the intersection and ensure that the necessary hardware and configuration is set up. So if you are a situ in a situation where you need two smart view 360s, it's something that we can definitely provide. And from a data perspective, you know, the turning movement count data as well as the analytics, they all support dual cam um, um, smart view 360s. And with that, I'm going to wrap things up. If there were questions that I didn't get to, I apologize. I'm going to save those and I'll personally email you myself because I'm seeing so much great discussion here, so much great engagement. I wanted to thank you because this has been a delightful webinar for me. It always makes it exciting when you have such an interactive audience. So thank you for, for participating. If you'd like more information, please get in touch with your sales team. Visit the Traffic Link Safety Analytics webpage. If you want to connect with me personally, I, I honestly enjoy talking to individuals in the industry. I know we've got a lot of time working from home right now. So if you want to get in touch, there's my email right there. Uh, and of course, feel free to follow my vision on all of our social channels. All of the handles are there present. Thanks again, everyone, and stay safe. Hope to see you soon.